fire rain down on my house. In our last video, we looked at seven supporting characters from Breaking Bad and how they reflect different forms that bad behavior can take. In the story of Walter White's descent into evil, the people around him serve as mirrors of what Breaking Bad looks like. So in this video, we're looking at seven more lost souls who've strayed from the righteous path in even more serious ways. No more half measures, Walter. If this were Dante's Inferno, right now we'd be beginning our descent into the lower circles of hell. Before we go on, we want to tell you a little bit about this video's sponsor. Mubi is a curated film streaming service with a twist. You get 30 films per month, a new film every day. It's a hand-picked selection of movie gems from around the world. We're huge fans of Mubi at Screen Prism, so click the link in our description below to get a full month of Mubi for free. The moral of the story is, I chose a half measure when I should have gone all the way. Mike Ehrmantraut represents pragmatic evil. The fixer for Saul, Gus, and later Walt, methodical Mike is practical in every sense of the word. Now, I don't know what kind of movies you've been watching, but here in the real world, we don't kill 11 people as some kind of prophylactic measure. Once he's made a decision to do something, he makes sure to do it excellently, thoroughly, without mistakes. He thinks through every eventuality. The next time you bring a gun to a job without telling me, I will stick it up your ass sideways. He's practical when it comes to morality, too. I've known good criminals and bad cops, bad priests, honorable thieves. His experiences on both sides of the law have made him completely skeptical that high-minded principles have any place in the real world. Mike has found that a pragmatic worldview is the only outlook that can make sense of all the contradictions and unfairness in what he's lived. My son wasn't dirty! So, with no justice to believe in, Mike concerns himself with carving out a much more manageably sized coat of honor and set of rules for himself. Me personally, I was hired to do a job. I did it. It's as far as it goes. The main rule Mike believes in is personal responsibility. He holds himself accountable for his actions and stays true to his word. You can be on one side of the law or the other. But if you make a deal with somebody, you keep your word. And he holds others responsible for their actions. Trust me, this woman deserves to die as much as any man I've ever met. Mike believes the people he encounters in his criminal endeavors have chosen to bear the consequences of their actions, just like he did. If it becomes necessary for him to kill them, they've brought that on themselves. Everyone sounds like Meryl Streep with a gun to their head. Ultimately, after accepting a world that is far less than ideal, he makes it his goal to ensure the well-being of those he feels personally responsible for. Everything else is beyond the realm of his personal responsibility. Don't make me beat you till your legs don't work. Mike is Walt's polar opposite, which explains Mike's extreme distaste for the great Heisenberg. You know how they say it's been a pleasure? It hasn't. Walt works in the drug business to fuel his own desire for even more power. Say my name. While Mike prides himself on knowing his place. You and your pride and your ego. You just had to be the man. If you'd done your job, known your place, we'd all be fine right now. Walt is a grandiose liar while Mike is brutally honest. What you packing? A pimento. Sorry, what? Pimento sandwich. Essentially, Mike's noble self-control highlights what an impulsive, out-of-control jerk Walt is becoming by contrast. You are a time bomb. Tick, tick, ticking. And I have no intention of being around for the boom. Somehow, in this line of work, Mike still retains a certain moral integrity. So, the moment when Walt kills Mike is one of the clearest signs we get that Heisenberg has won over Walter White. <laughs> Cup. Let me die in peace. I would like a cup of hot water, filtered, if possible, and a single slice of lemon. And I'm assuming you don't have stevia. Never mind. I brought my own. Lydia Rodart Quayle is guilty of the kind of evil that is born of desperation. 
The head of logistics at Madrigal Electromotive and Gus Fring's distribution liaison is, as her last name suggests, always quailing. Okay. No. No. Not. Okay, Mike. Not. Okay. The... The look he just gave me was the very antithesis of okay. Okay? Breathe, Lydia. High-strung Lydia is not cut out for a life of crime. Lydia is willing to do literally anything if she thinks it will help keep her safe. I can grow your business exponentially. Just give me the list. I can do that by helping you expand into a larger, highly active, highly profitable marketplace. So she shows how total desperation is one of the most dangerous motivations out there for making people do evil things. Yeah, I'll take paranoid any day for getting gang raped by prison guards. A desperate person has really lost him or herself altogether. Any concern or sense of responsibility for others Lydia may have once felt goes out the window because she is terrified all the time. You're tying up loose ends and I don't want to be one of them. She's like a drowning person who instinctively grabs blindly at other swimmers, not caring if she pulls them down with her. When Walt talks to Lydia, we can really see how far he has come in his transformation. You're a smart businesswoman. You understand the concept of leverage? Please don't patronize me. I hate that. You have none. Less than a year ago, he was unsure and stuttering in front of a fearsome drug lord. Now it's Lydia who's afraid for her life at the mere sight of him. You know that you have rights? The Constitution says you do, and so do I. Saul Goodman embodies the evil of opportunism. I'm a lawyer. Even drug dealers need lawyers, right? Especially drug dealers. If there's a chance to make a quick buck, Walt and Jesse's criminal lawyer jumps at it, happy to bend any legal or moral lines that stand in the way. Conscience gets expensive, doesn't it? We'll delve much more into how and why Jimmy McGill becomes this person in an upcoming Better Call Saul video. But by the time Walt meets him, Saul is hardened into a truly criminal lawyer. Seriously, when the going gets tough, you don't want a criminal lawyer, right? You want a criminal lawyer. Saul advertises himself in front of cheesy renderings of a constitution and an American flag. And that's why I fight for you, Albuquerque! And Saul's character highlights some of the paradoxes of what is considered right and good in American society. In some respects, he fits our cultural standards for an exemplary citizen. He's got an amazing work ethic, an ingenious entrepreneurial spirit, and endless gumption. Don't drink and drive, but if you do, call me. It's precisely Saul's lack of moral scruples that makes him so good at his job. If you're committed enough, you can make any story work. I, I once convinced a woman that I was Kevin Costner, and it worked because I believed it. He has the mental and moral flexibility to find a loophole in anything. This dude got Emilio off like twice, okay? Both times, they had him dead to rights, yo, and then poof. Dude's like Houdini. So in him, we get a portrait of our culture's dedication to getting ahead at all costs. He's the axiom, America is the land of opportunity, taken a little too literally. So if you want to make more money and uh, keep the money that you make, Better call Saul! What's ultimately scary and dangerous about Saul's outlook is the lack of a moral center. If a prison shanky is completely off the table, and we're sure of that, no shanking! The absence of any scruple or principle that can't be violated to hold him back. That's the way of the world, kid. Go with the winner. As the season four finale of Better Call Saul told us, Saul's philosophy essentially becomes. Walt makes extensive use of this opportunistic evil, and his bond with Saul cements his growing ambitions to build his criminal operation into a true business empire. There's no honor among thieves, except for us, of course. <laughs> Tuco Salamanca is an embodiment of evil as unprovoked, senseless violence. Tuco is the first real drug lord we meet on the show, and he fits our preconception of what a drug dealer or a bad guy in general is like. I'm gonna rewrite history with this. <laughs> All right. Touch 
He's erratic, unhinged, and will fly off the handle for no reason at all. In his first meeting with Walt, he beats one of his own associates to death for speaking out of turn. Whoa! Damn, man, look at that, look! Counterintuitive as it may seem, just any old violence isn't enough to make someone evil in our society's eyes. There are plenty of forms of violence our culture condones or even applauds. In fact, studies have found that we as a society are especially averse not to all violence, but to unprovoked violence specifically. The character of Tuco personifies exactly this kind of unpredictable, spontaneous violence that we tend to dislike and fear the most. No, man. It is by design that Tuco is one of the first overtly evil characters we get to know early on. I like doing business with a family man. There's always a lot of collateral. Tuco's frightening persona is the complete opposite of meek season one Walt. So this contrast helps us justify Walt's behavior. Surely calm and clever Walt is nothing like those crazy actual drug dealers. But Walt swiftly comes to embody this senselessly violent evil too. Even right after winning his negotiation with Tuco, Walt exits the house and screams in his car. So already we're seeing him incorporate aspects of the evil people he meets into his rapidly growing Heisenberg persona. What the hell is wrong with you? We're a family! Back to work. Gus Fring gives human form to soulless, corporate evil. I don't believe fear to be an effective motivator. I want investment. Gus is the ultimate multi-hyphenate. Successful business owner, pillar of the Albuquerque community, benevolent employer, and ruthless murderer. I will kill your wife. I will kill your son. I will kill you. A corporation, by definition, is a group of individuals acting and legally viewed as a single entity. Gus is essentially what that single entity would look like if it came alive and became one man. Pollos hermanos or something delicious is always cooking. By making the corporation corporeal, Vince Gilligan and his team of writers managed to portray an elusive type of evil that is extremely dangerous in today's world. No, van a matar a Walter White. No, hasta que haya concluido mi negocio con él. When we see something bad happen, our impulse is to look for the guilty individual parties in order to hold them accountable. But what's so frightening about corporate evil is that there is no single human who's responsible. The evil enacted on the world stems from the principles that govern the corporation itself. A corporation exists only to increase growth and profits. As appealing or intriguing as polite and calculating Gus might seem, there is no there there. I'm sure if you keep digging, you'll find me. As Gus comes on the scene in Walt's story, this is a signal that Walt is thinking bigger. What you two need is an honest-to-God businessman, right? Somebody who treats your product like the simple, high-margin commodity that it is. His startup wants to scale. I'm in the empire business. I told you, numb nuts, this guy's OG. Hector Salamanca demonstrates the evil code of honor. Me and my family, we built this old business. Silent and motionless in his wheelchair, Tuco's and the cousin's uncle is like a living totem with near supernatural powers. A living embodiment of cartel rules. Rule number one, family is all. La familia es todo. And rule number two, never talk to the DEA. W, X, Y. All right. Yeah, thanks. I, uh, I can spell. For him, the rule that family is everything far outweighs the well-being of any of his actual family members. So if one of his family members were to kill another, Hector might easily feel it is his duty to kill the remaining one in order to observe his rule that family must not harm family. 
si quieres salvarlo. This kind of paradoxical, extreme observation of principles makes Hector a far more terrifying form of evil than the senseless randomness that we saw in his nephew, Tuco. Salamanca did! Salamanca money! Salamanca blood! And it explains why Hector manages somehow to stay around so long and remain so powerful, even long after he would seem to be pretty much incapacitated and impotent. Hector is clearly an evil person. How about your payment is you get to live? Yet he genuinely believes in the thing that Walt keeps telling everyone he values most, family. Now, the Salamanca name dies with you. Yet in Hector's case, standing by family means dominating in the bloody, inhuman drug trade, because that is what the Salamanca family does. This is what comes of blood for blood, Hector. Sangre por sangre. So Hector's character illustrates that any ideology or code, even if it's based on good values, becomes evil when taken to the extreme. So no, this isn't personal. Todd Alquist represents evil for evil's sake. The nephew of neo-Nazi Uncle Jack is a true blue sadist. Think of the eagerness with which he jumps at the job of torturing Jesse. I mean, I could do it. I mean, him, we got, we got history. Later, Todd punishes Jesse for trying to escape by shooting Andrea and making Jesse watch. But the degree to which Todd's worldview is warped is shown best in the episode Dead Freight. When a kid on a dirt bike happens on the crew robbing the train, Todd immediately shoots the child dead. No! That shit happens, huh? After Todd is extremely worried, but not because he feels guilty for killing a child, he worries that Walt will think less of him. But did I make a mistake, Mr. White? Because to me, you know, respectfully, I was looking out for the team. I didn't want to kill him. You, you gotta believe that. Todd is one of the most terrifying representations of evil we get in Breaking Bad. Someone completely devoid of empathy who genuinely enjoys causing pain. Most of the other characters have some justification for doing things that hurt others. But for Todd, evil actions are an end unto themselves. So the fact that Todd becomes Walt's second in command in season five, replacing Jesse, shows how far Walt has come in his transition into pure evil. He has finally crossed over into the territory of evil for its own sake. Hey man, I gotta know we're square. We're gonna have to go that other way. Walt was written in a way that made it very hard to completely dismiss him, even at his most despicable. And each of the types in this list inspires a similar type of conflicted empathy. Each has something endearing or at least laughably ridiculous about them. Does that ring a bell? I mean, the guy actually has to ring a uh, bell. Yes. Tuco's devotion to his Tio, Todd's awkward crush on Lydia, or Mike's down-to-earth expertise and unflappable charm. It'd be nice, it'd be nice. Let Wendell in there. Wendell doesn't eat, nobody eats. By producing unforgettable, appealing characters and then making all of them pretty darn bad, Breaking Bad forces us to look without flinching at people who do evil things. It gives us the space to honestly evaluate our own morals and ask how we measure up on this complex scale of sins. Altogether, this makes Breaking Bad perhaps the most thorough and profound televisual exploration of evil ever created. I did it for me. I liked it. I was good at it. Hi guys, this is Alani, the newest member of the Screen Prism team. And today I want to talk to you about one of our favorite places to watch movies, Mubi. Mubi is a treasure trove of films from around the globe. Every day a new film is added and the oldest is taken away. So in this world where it's very easy to spend hours debating what you should watch, 
Mubi is like having a really cool friend with amazing taste in movies, making it so much easier for you. They feature hard-to-come-by masterpieces, indie festival darlings, influential art house and foreign films, lesser-known films by your favorite famous directors, and more. Plus, you can even download the films to watch offline, and there are no ads, ever. Right now, Mubi is showing a selection of films from the projection section of the New York Film Festival, which took place just last month. This essential program aims to challenge our expectations of what the moving image can do, and Mubi has curated a selection of this year's highlights, including groundbreaking new films like The Glass Note and Wishing Well that you shouldn't miss. Point is, we can't recommend Mubi highly enough. You can try it out for free for a whole month. Just click the link in the description below.